And we're live. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Gigi Elbayumi of the Rodham Institute here at GW School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Our mission at the Rodham Institute is to improve health equity for all Washingtonians. Let me give you sort of the brief update about what's happening around COVID. Uh, first of all, the uh, Moderna vaccine was just approved for kids between the ages of 12 and up now, um, and so has uh, Pfizer. Uh, we are waiting on Johnson & Johnson. We are waiting on um, the six-month-olds to the 12-year-olds, and that research and clinical trials are actually going on right now. We're expecting that in the summertime sometime, which is not that far around, along the, around the corner, we will be able to um, begin to vaccinate uh, babies six months and older. Uh, okay, so what's happening in the country vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, COVID? Well, over 50% of Americans are now vaccinated, fully vaccinated, and it is President Biden's goal to vaccinate 70% of all adults by July 4th. What's new on the scene is kind of scary, and we're trying to learn a little bit more, is the um, variant that is really unfortunately wiping out hundreds, if not thousands, of, um, of our brothers and sisters in India. Um, it's unclear exactly what the reason is. There may be probably several reasons coming together, whether there is a variant that is more contagious or more deadly, that's what um, researchers are trying to work out right now. So as we now uh, shift to the end of May, uh, to remind everybody it's uh, Mental Health Awareness Month and I'm just gonna share with you, I've been seeing a lot of distress, a lot of crying, a lot of just can't take it anymore. And if you're in that boat or you know anybody who is, please go to our website to see what mental health resources there are. There is help out there and you're not alone. I think everybody at some level is having some degree of difficulty. Um, and you know, we've been through a collective trauma is one way that we can look at it. We've been away from our friends and family, especially young people have missed so many milestones. So I just want to make sure that we take care of each other because that's what communities do. And um, if you need help, don't be shy, don't be embarrassed, don't be ashamed. Um, there's a lot of help out there and please go to our website to take a look at those resources. All righty, without further ado, I'd like to bring my colleagues on, um, Dr. Adam Friedman, who is the chair of dermatology at GW and is a friend, welcome. Thank you so and, much. Yeah, thank you. Look at you all sunny and fresh. And, <laughs> yeah, I love it. Love it. Welcome, Dr. Friedman. It's good to see you. You as well. And uh, Dr. Patel, welcome as well. Uh, it's nice to have you here. Um, so Dr. Friedman, we'll start with you. Tell us about yourself. And uh, then I know that you've got some PowerPoint slides to, to share, but um, just tell us about yourself first. And are any of the kids that you have there any of your own? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, in hindsight's 2020. I probably should have had a gratuitous kid shot, which uh, they do train us in early as medical school, always put pictures of your kids in presentations. So I have failed all my mentors and I will hang my head in shame for that. Um, but uh, no, as, as you mentioned, I do have, have two amazing children, Oliver and Daphne, who are eager to go to summer camp, though of course they'll be armed with gallons of sunscreen and sun protective gear, as, as any good children of dermatologists should. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a native New Yorker, um, as uh, my, my colleagues also spend time in, in New York as well, um, and uh, I've been a Washingtonian for roughly six years and, and have enjoyed every, every moment of it. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Patel to introduce himself and share something about himself as well. Thanks, Dr. Friedman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gigi, for, for inviting me and for having me, and, and you, Dr. Friedman, as well, esteemed colleagues here. To, uh, it's a real honor to be here. Uh, my name is Vishal Patel. I am a cutaneous oncologist. I uh, run the skin cancer program at the GW Cancer Center and the director of dermatologic surgery. Um, and a new Washingtonian just for the last two years, Dr. Friedman, recruited me to Washington, uh, Washington and has been the uh, best decision 
ever. Uh, previously was in, in New York at Columbia for about 10 years. Uh, and and I, I think that this is the best kept secret in the world or our amusement community that we have. But we're excited to be here and thanks again. Well, thank you. And Dr. Friedman, before you start, this is not just a presentation for white people, am I right? Oh, you, you nailed it on the head. And, and that's one of the kind of things I wanna highlight with all the photos we have here is that the sun does not discriminate, skin cancer doesn't discriminate. And so good, a good sun protection approach is gonna be important for everybody. I don't care what age you are, gender, skin tone, everyone needs to consider the potential harmful effects of, of, of the sun on the skin. And we're gonna talk about some of those specific key things today as part of this presentation. And also, I know you have some really hard hitting questions for Dr. Patel and myself. Got it. Please go ahead, we're all ears. All right, so you know we, we kind of already hit, hit the nail on the head that this is a presentation and a discussion for literally everybody. And, and one of the things we hope that you walk away with from, from this discussion is how to be sun smart year round. You know, you heard this is the uh, Mental Health Awareness Month. It's also Skin Cancer Awareness Month, but really we gotta be sun smart on a daily basis. So I'm not gonna sit here and say the sun is all bad. It does allow for life on our planet. That's a good thing. It keeps us warm. It helps all the plants grow that we need uh, in order to sustain life. But there are also some consequences to, to the sun. Sunburn, and of course, on the extreme end of that would be skin cancer. So kind of hitting those helpful things, I, I, wanna, I wanna play both sides of it. I don't wanna say, oh, sun is all bad. And I know a lot of people think dermatologists encourage people to be vampires sitting in a dark corner. No, we want mm -hmm. you to have your cake and eat it too. Um, and, and certainly the sun keeps us warm. It helps plants grow. Um, it does help us make vitamin D through the skin. And we'll kind of get into some of the misperceptions and things about vitamin D in the skin and sun exposure. Um, it's actually antibacterial. You know, in the lab, we use ultraviolet radiation to actually kill all types of organisms from, from impacting our experiments. So actually it can be very helpful in that respect. Uh, it gives us light support to be able to see during the day, many other benefits. But sadly, there are also some harmful effects. Sunburns, it can accelerate the aging of our skin and that, that can look like wrinkles, dark marks, light marks, you name it. We mentioned skin cancer, but also even as dermatologists, we have to think about other first interfaces of, of, of the body to the outside world. And, and eye damage is certainly one of those as well. So kind of reiterate, sun is necessary for life, no question. But ultraviolet radiation, which comes in a couple different flavors, we most notably talk about ultraviolet A and B. And now we're starting to talk a little bit about C2, but really it's about A and B. These you cannot feel, you cannot see. It's not the warmth you're feeling on a hot summer day. It's, it's actually an invisible form of light that can cause damage to our skin over time that can lead to all those horrible things we mentioned before. But of course, in the acute sense, in the immediate sense, causing a painful a sunburn that can be very limiting on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, how impactful ultraviolet radiation is will depend on what day it is, what time of year, location, altitude, you know, uh, if you're on a mountain or, uh, you know, uh, sea level, uh, the weather, reflection. Uh, so to that point, you can easily get burned while skiing on a very cold day. And, and the ozone, which we don't talk about so much anymore, but we still should, that's what's actually filtering out ultraviolet C radiation. So we don't really talk about it that much with sun protection, but it's something we may have to think about in the future, but really it's going to be A and B. Now it's actually pretty easy to know how strong ultraviolet radiation is. You can just literally go on any search engine, go on Google or whatever, and find these, these various scales on a day-to-day -day basis. And any index above five or six or higher indicates that that UV radiation is strong and can cause all those harmful things we mentioned. Granted, we're not gonna not use sun protective measures when it's between one and five, but it can give you an easy sense of how strong the harmful parts of the sun uh, can be on a daily basis. So that's something that you can easily check in a matter of seconds every single day. So to that end, how can you be sun smart on a daily basis? How can you be a sun smart warrior? So there are a lot of very simple things you can implement on a daily basis. So we like to say avoid peak hours between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. every day, especially during the summer. I'm a realist. That's impossible. And I know Dr. Patel and I with young kids, that's just not happening. They're going outside and you're going with them. So if you have to be outside during these peak times, do the various things that I'm gonna talk about to really avoid that direct exposure that can cause harm. 
seeking shade, utilize shade, and that could be natural or uh, constructed sources. If possible, cover up, you know, physical protectants, clothing, hats, sunglasses, those are probably the best form of protection, but certainly sunscreen is, is another really great way to protect the exposed areas. I'm not saying go out there in a bodysuit, but those areas like the face, the ears, the neck, both front and back, the arms and the back of the hands, those are areas that are commonly going to be exposed, even if you are wearing clothing, you're not at the beach or, or the pool. Um, I'm not going to belabor this. Just say no to tanning beds, plain and simple. We don't need to dive in. That is just, that, that is just that's, that, that's literally equivalent to smoking cigarettes. Uh, and then as I mentioned, watch the UV index to know how strong the sun is. So here's kind of a generic way to look at a sunscreen to kind of understand what you're looking for. So some of the key things are going to be, you want to see that broad spectrum, which means it's covering both A and B ultraviolet radiation. Here it says SPF 15, I really recommend higher and I'll explain why in just a moment. And then if you flip the, the bottle on the back, you'll see the active ingredients, the, the actual ingredients that are the filters, the blockers that will protect you uh, from the sun. And I'll talk about why it's important to actually look at how many are in there uh, and which ones are there as well. So let's, let's dive in some basic questions. So what is that term SPF? And I think some people use the term SPF interchangeably with sunscreen. They, they kind of mean one and the same to, to many, but really what SPF stands for is sun protection factor. And it only refers to blocking ultraviolet B radiation. It has nothing to do with A. Now, an easy way to remember this, B is for burning. This is the type of ultraviolet radiation that will cause that really painful red type burn from, from un, unrestricted exposure. But we don't want to forget about A. We call that the silent killer because while it doesn't burn you, not only does it cause all the horrible things long-term that UVB does, it actually penetrates deeper into the skin and that can cause damage to the support structures that leads to that accelerated skin aging like wrinkles and, and dark marks and things like that. The other question we get a lot is, should I wear an SPF 1 billion? And the answer to that is, you know, above an SPF 50, you're not gonna do much better. And so the American Academy of Dermatology recommends an SPF 30 or higher, higher than that 15 you saw before. Um, so one can argue, well, you know, 93 to 99%, is it really worth it? I, I would say it probably is because there's no different in price and feel. The problem is that most people don't apply enough sunscreen to actually get that number. That SPF number is based on applying a substantial amount of sunscreen per surface area on the skin. And there's plenty of studies showing that most people apply a quarter to a half of what is needed to get that. So in my mind, I'm thinking, well, technically an SPF 100 is not gonna give you another you know, percent or two, because really 99 is the highest you can go, but because of that dilution, because people aren't applying enough, that 100 becomes a 50, that 50 becomes a 25. And there may be some value for those higher SPFs only because we just don't apply them the right way. So that's kind of a practical approach to those higher SPF numbers. Next question, how much should we be applying and how often should it be applied? So we recommend applying roughly 15 to 20 minutes before going outside because the sunscreen has to kind of settle in the top layer of the skin to truly be effective. We want to apply to all exposed areas and we roughly say a shot glass, as you see here, um, amount to cover all those exposed areas. But remember, most people are applying not enough. Certain areas not to forget, and there have been plenty of studies showing that we do forget around the eyes and the lips. And actually these areas are more sensitive. The eye area around the eyes, the skin's a little thinner there, so less inherent and in natural protection. And the lips actually don't really have the top layer that our skin does that does have some natural sun protecting factors in it. So really don't forget those areas. And we do recommend reapplying every two hours if you're gonna be outside for long periods of time or after swimming or perspiring heavily. So this is kind of what that looks like. And you see that two teaspoons, that's a big wad of sunscreen. I, I imagine most people are not applying that much. So let's say you are applying the right amount. Well, what about what type of sunscreen, what ingredients should you look for? So there are many forms and flavors, ointment, creams, gels, and sprays, some of which actually are not regulated by the FDAs. Um, you know, powders, for example, wipes, the, these kind of get away and fly under the radar and, not are and are not evaluated the right way. But really what it comes down to is personal choice. I tell all my patients that the right sunscreen for you, separate from those key things, 
SPF 30 or higher, broad spectrum, and I'll throw in also water resistant to 80 minutes, it's the one you're gonna use repeatedly. And everyone's skin's a little different, how it looks on the skin, and we'll get into that, but also how it feels on the skin. So certain formulations I think are gonna be more helpful for other areas. So for example, sticks, I find really good for around the eyes. Just make sure you get four passes on any area. Um, lotions or solutions or even sprays for hair bearing areas are a little easier to apply. But once again, it's more about what's written on the bottle that gives you insight in terms of how much it's going to protect you. The other thing to consider is the cosmesis. What does it look like when you apply to the skin? And, and certainly you put a ton on, especially of the kind of historic minerals like zinc and titanium. You can look like the guy on the upper right hand corner, no matter what your skin tone is. But what we're finding is that there is a lot of difficulty finding a sunscreen that plays nice with darker skin tones. Even ones that may rub in easily on fair skin may not necessarily on darker skin. And with that appearance that you're seeing on the lower right hand corner, that cosmetic outcome can really prevent many from using sunscreen the right way. So we're, I'll get into some ways to kind of look for uh, and get information about products that can play nice in all skin tones. So one way to go about it is ultra fine sunscreens. What this means is those zinc and titanium particles, those mineral sunscreens, which have been around forever. You know, remember those lifeguards with the bright white noses? Um, that's zinc or titanium. When you shrink those particles down, as you're seeing in these pictures, they don't scatter visible light as well. And so you can make them invisible on the skin. And that's what ultra fine or micro fine sunscreens mean when it says that on the label. And I find those rub in a little bit better than the kind of older versions of those zinc and titanium products. The other thing is, if you combine multiple sunscreen ingredients, so for example, you were to combine both micro fine zinc and some of the chemical sunscreen absorbers, the more you have, the less you need of each of them, but also something really amazing happens. When you combine them, you don't get an added effect. Meaning if you have an SPF three of one and a four of another, it doesn't equal seven. It actually ends up higher than that because they actually work together and protect one another from breaking down over time. So my advice to a lot of my patients is look for a product that has multiple sunscreen ingredients as you see blown up here, because they, that tends to work better because of that synergistic effect. And here's just a very rudimentary uh, kind of picture of how combining both chemical and the mineral, the zinc or titanium together, because one will scatter the light off the skin and the others will absorb it and dispel that harmful energy. Um, and I realize I am not a, um, uh, a, you know, a, a, a digital design person. So I apologize for the very limited ability of using PowerPoint here to, to really show this. So I really wanna highlight, there is help out there. I, I wanna highlight one of my colleagues who was actually in the process of becoming um, a, a, a voluntary faculty member and assistant professor with us, um, Dr. Alan Kakam, uh, who goes by Brown Skin Germ on social media, who's been doing an incredible job actually taking all of the sunscreens and testing them on herself to kind of show how they look on her skin versus not applied areas. But also she does surveys to kind of create these report cards on different sunscreens. And I, I'm not promoting Supergroup in any way. This was just one, one example. So I, I find her information very evidence-based and helpful. So for those of you who uh, really need that guidance to find sunscreens that fit well with your skin tone, um, this is one example of dermatologists online really making a difference. So let's play a little game here. No, not about global thermonuclear war, but about <laughs> your fund of knowledge when it comes to sunscreens. So true or false? you can get sunburn on a cloudy day. Dr. Patel, what do you think? I think since you're <laughs> asking the question, that answer would be true. That is true. So cloud, cloudy, sunny, doesn't matter. Ultraviolet radiation can definitely cause harm. True or false, you only need to wear sunscreen when you're at the beach. That's kind of a leading question, right? False, you know, you don't have to be sunbathing, and get damaged. You can get damaged just walking down the street at noon during the summer for literally 10 to 15 minutes. So every day is a sunscreen day to exposed areas. This is, I kind of mentioned this before, but it's always good to, to be repetitive. Sunscreens with SPF of less than 15 is enough to protect my skin. And that, that, that goes to all skin tones. And I, I see Dr. Albayumi shaking her head. So of course the answer is false. You need 15 or higher. True or false, my skin doesn't get sunburned. So I don't need to worry about protecting myself from overexposure to the sun. I can just go out and do whatever I want. 
That's a very leading true false question. The answer is false. Uh, even if you don't get burned, damage is occurring. Even if you can't feel it or see it, that can lead to harmful things like skin cancer. So a reminder, you don't gotta do this, but you need to be <laughs> sun smart. Sunscreen to expose areas, seek shade when possible, protective clothing, not to this crazy degree, hats, sunglasses. You can be fashionable and sun smart at the same time. Um, though I'm sure people are cringing with me saying that. And with that, <laughs> I'm going to end with a dad joke for my kids. Knock, knock. Who's there? Anita. Anita who? I need another bottle of SPF 30 plus <laughs> water resistant up to 80 minutes sunscreen. <laughs> and with that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Elba Yumi to get into some hard questions. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. You know, when I used to go, when we used to go to Egypt during the summertime to visit my um, grandparents, my grandmother would forbid us to go out in the sun sort of during the very high sun times, which in Egypt in the summertime is basically during the day. Um, so it's always been kind of an interesting um, cultural phenomenon that people sit out and sit in the sun where in other countries and other cultures, the sun is revered both as being positive, but also as having potential, um, potential problems and harms. So I see uh, patients um, in my clinic, I'm a general internist. And actually this year I called you up because one of my patients had really, really bad effects from the sun. Um, I think the technical term is polymorphous light eruption, but sun um, poisoning is, is another word that sometimes is used. And she was African-American, she is African-American and thankfully, did fine, especially with your great care, your team's great care. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So, so you know, thus far we just discussed basic sun protective approaches for everybody. But to that end, there are also many conditions that are worsened by the sun. There are autoimmune conditions like lupus. Um, you mentioned polymorphous light eruption, but there are several different conditions that the sun will actually instigate. And we define them based on when that happens. People can actually even get hives within a matter of minutes of going outside. And depending on the condition, we're gonna use a whole host of different medications to treat that. But at the center of this is going to be good sun protection, which includes sunscreen, physical protections, avoiding the sun when possible. But, but our job is not to hide people from going outdoors and, and living their lives. Our, our, our job is to enable people to have the best quality of life while being safe. And so that's really where these measures fit in. It's, it's not about hiding, it's about doing the right thing so you can go out, have fun, and now we're starting to go out more, um, mm -hmm. but we need to do so in, in a safe way. And that's where these very basic tenants really uh, need to be employed every single day. And you know, I prescribe medications like antibiotics and blood pressure medications, and those can actually cause sun sensitization. The thiazide diuretics, oh, yeah. the sulfa-based, any other commonly use medic prescribed medications that we should think about? Yeah, you know, I'm so glad you brought up the thiazide uh, direct or water pills. There was a, just a recent very large study showing that uh, being on those can increase the risk for skin cancer. Uh, we've known that for some time in dermatology, but actually a common one that, that we employ, uh, doxycycline, which is an oral antibiotic used for a lot of different conditions like acne, it's probably the most common, that too will make you more sensitive to the sun. And that's true for everybody. We call it a phototoxic, meaning sun toxic reaction, where no matter who you are, you're on this medicine and you're out in the sun, if you're not protecting yourself, you will get a almost exaggerated bad sunburn. Uh, but yeah, I'll turn to Dr. Patel because I'm sure, you know, he, he's, he's probably seen this quite a lot in counsel's patients in his yeah, own Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Friedman. We're going to toss it to you, Dr. Patel. You're up. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting point. We have for about 10 years now had a suspicion that these chronic medications that you take are, are doing this uh, subclinical damage. And it, it takes years and years before you realize those points. And so when we, when we um, uh, stress being sun smart and sun safe, it's because we know how harmful the rays are, but also because we're learning things as we go. And, uh, you know, the key to all healthcare, and we're going to talk about this over and over and over again I, today with some of the other topics we want to go into, is that moderation is key and for anything. And I think it, it is safe to be moderate uh, and to be smart. And so as we realize now that we know that blood pressure medications, the thiazide diuretics, 
does increase your risk because what it, what it does is the breakdown of that medication uh, can, can deposit in the skin and lead to a more exaggerated uh, UV reaction there and causing localized damage. Um, that's something that, uh, that we had always suspected and only after time knows that we know and, and being moderate in, about our sun in, in general uh, helps prevent some of that side effect. So, so we'll, we'll reiterate that point, but it goes without saying that being sun smart uh, can be moderating and protecting yourself. So does that mean, because, you know, diuretics from our standpoint, both from the standpoint of the heart, as well as preventing strokes and all these kinds of things, these are exceedingly safe medications. Does that mean that one should, you know, not use these? Because then you would lose the benefit of them. Or what would you, how would you uh, sort of advise or counsel people on these medicines, especially in the summertime? Absolutely. Absolutely. What I like to ex explain to my patients is that this is not a, a one cause and one effect relationship. Mm -hmm. And it takes years of a certain type of behavior to lead to a, a certain effect. Um, and, and most patients, I think most patients we take care of now who are seeing this, the skin cancer epidemic, we're really well aware of the cultural revolution and then uh, and demotion of smoking, right? And, and we went through a phase of it being cool and hip and in vogue to completely the opposite and then realizing after years how much of, of, of a toll that takes on somebody's not only pulmonary lung health, but their overall health uh, as a whole. Well, that's what I explain about the sun is that, again, it's about moderation. It's about being reasonable, not just an all or nothing dichotomous. It's either yes or no uh, relationship, but saying that your overall health is important to take these medications and knowing that you are um, there is a small increased risk. And if you don't control that over 20 years, then, well, that's going to add up, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't live your life and go to the beach at the summer or go to your family trip to, you know, to somewhere. Um, you just want to be sun smart so that you're protecting yourself, especially when you identify if there is an increased risk. So tell us about what you do. I mean, you're a dermatologist that specializes in cancer. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. My, my practice and my expertise is completely focused on, on skin cancer, on uh, two types of cancer. There's what we uh, colloquially group them as melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancers. But we really like to talk about the cells where the cancer is coming from. Um, and, and because that's in the skin and there's various types of skin, uh, we, we are focused on the cancers that arise from those uh, cells when they go awry or when, when they're uh, mutated. And, and that can be a very complex and have very variety of presentations. Uh, and so that at, Dr. Friedman recruited me to come here because we really needed that at GW. Uh, and now we've created a program just focused on that. And that's all I spend my time doing is that. I make the joke that we talked about doxycycline and acne. Uh, my wife is also a medical dermatologist and, and Adam is a good friend. And one time I had to cover for them and provide doxycycline for an acne patient and totally forgot to remind them about being sun smart because it's just not something I do regularly anymore. I'm just worried about skin cancer. Uh, and, uh, and that's what excites me. So th the common types of skin cancers are the basal cell and the squamous cell. Can you tell us what parts of the bodies um, of that, what part of the body those two are and, and how dangerous are they? Definitely. Um, so the two major cells that we talk about in our skin are keratinocytes. Those are the main cells that make up uh, the epidermis, the outer layer of our skin. And within that layer is melanocytes. And those are the cells that make up the pigment of our skin. And so this, the substance is the keratinocytes and the pigment is the melanocytes. When the keratinocytes go awry, they can either make squamous or basal cell skin cancers. And these tend to be localized lesions that have a very good prognosis. You, you, uh, they're very slow to grow. And if you catch them and treat them early, you almost have a hundred percent cure rate. And it's not something that's going to affect your overall, uh, life. On the other hand, um, melanomas, which come from melanocytes, they are very unpredictable and we're still learning about them, how they behave. We used to think we knew about them. We've learned a lot in the last 10 years and it's changed kind of how we're managing and preventing this disease those can be much more uh, aggressive and vigorous um, from the get-go. 
And sometimes even the biggest tumors do nothing and the smallest ones can lead to really bad outcomes. And so that's where we want to educate patients because not all melanomas are the same and not all risk is the same. Um, and, and it's hard for patients to understand that because they only kind of get the snippet and, it's, and we generalize that, but we want to be smarter about thinking about our risk. So Jimmy Carter had melanoma that went to his brain a few years ago now. I mean, which, you know, when I was in medical school, that would mean that he maybe would have had a couple of months to live, but he's doing pretty well. Can you tell us why? We're very, very excited in the world of skin cancer um, about that. I use that story actually in every one of my melanoma patients because they can relate to it. And I remember reading that um, I was uh, I was a fellow at Columbia and immediately thinking just like you, that that was it, it was a few more months. But that was the time when the holy grail, what we consider now the holy grail of oncology, of, uh, especially in skin cancer, is immunotherapy. Utilizing our own immune system and giving a little kick in the pants and a little help boost up to fight those cancer cells. Um, and, and he was one of the early recipients of that drug and is now in complete remission. He had metastatic brain metastases and metastases throughout his body of melanoma. And by all indications, there's no evidence of that. And uh, um, he's continuing to do well. We're really excited about that because uh, myself and GW have been involved in some of the seminal clinical trials around that for melanoma initially, but now for squamous cell cancer, because we're realizing there's a lot of patients um, that are being missed that we used to have all of our attention at, at squamous cell, but excuse me, at melanoma, but there is a lot of deaths in, mel in squamous cell cancer and the immunotherapy drug works even appears to work better there. Um, and we have two clinical trials uh, open here. We're leading that uh, a global large clinical trial for uh, two pharmaceutical companies. Um, and, and the patients, I, I can't even begin to tell you how remarkable it is. I, we're talking about you know, tumors the size of the whole forearm shrinking away after a number of doses. Now, this doesn't happen all the time, but it's really exciting because this has changed the field of cutaneous oncology. We went from thinking there was no option when you had advanced disease to now talking about remission. Mm -hmm. So who's at the greatest risk of developing skin cancer? Well, skin, what I like to tell patients is that everybody is at risk for skin cancer, but your overall risk is different depending on um, your genetic uh, traits, your, your family risk, uh, your personal makeup, and then medications that you have to take or other issues that have happened, maybe your, your profession and exposure risk. Um, but generally we think that skin cancer more commonly and at a higher rate affects patients with lighter skin tones and those patients that, um, that may have certain genetic mutations, as well as those taking medications that lower their immune system, specifically organ transplant patients that really lowers their immune system and they develop lots. And oftentimes they don't die of their transplant related issues. It's the skin cancer uh, that kills them. Really? I didn't know that. That is one of the biggest uh, risks for them. And it's, it has been a large focus, especially if you have the more drugs you need to take to control your transplant, lung, pancreas, heart, higher combinations, it lowers the body's immune system. And you can think of your skin um, and the sun as, as constantly being harmed by uh, rays that are causing cancer. And the immune system picks that up on a daily basis, mm -hmm. but eventually it's gonna lose. It's not gonna go you know, a perfect season, 180 and zero every year after year after year. And, mm -hmm. and that is when we lower that with immune suppressive drugs, it really puts those patients at risk. But that doesn't mean patients with darker skin tones or those who are not on those medications or those who don't have a family history are not at risk. What it means is that there's a continuum and you may have a 0.1% risk or a 10% risk and that it's really important to, um, to, to understand, evaluate that risk and then how to then manage that. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. But everybody, want, you know, we want to, everybody to know that the sun is carcinogenic. It's like smoking. We don't want anybody to, to smoke uh -huh. or we want to moderate any exposure. And that's the uh -huh. same thing for the sun. So you're also including in the transplant, kidney transplants, which are much more common, right? Absolutely. Kidney transplants actually 20 years ago was where we, we figured out 
uh, or we learned we were seeing kidney transplants having tons of skin cancers. Mm -hmm. And the regimens for kidney transplants, the immunosuppressive regimens that they have to take to control their transplant so they don't have rejection of that transplant has gotten extremely more sophisticated, uh, specifically around both rejection, but, but specifically skin cancer risk. And mm -hmm. so kidney transplants now um, have significantly reduced their risk. If you have kidney and pancreas, that's a different uh, uh, boat. Uh, mm -hmm. But we used to, we, we kind of say that liver has the least risk because it needs the least amount of drugs to control the transplant and kidney is close behind that now. Um, oh, okay. the groups that we worry about, but that wasn't always the case. And what's important is that for a lot of our patients in our community, um, they've been transplanted years ago. And so it's important to stay on top of that because that's something that should be tweaked. You think something's working on fine, but mm -hmm. you might want to tweak that regimen because that's the risk that's going to happen 10 or 20 years after your transplant, mm -hmm. it's not your kidney mm -hmm. transplant, it's skin cancer. So I remember reading in medical school, how I would remember it, that some of the more dangerous types of melanomas that were actually deadlier were in people with darker skin tones and they occur in different places like the palms and the soles of, of uh, soles of the feet, palms of the hands. Is that right? That's correct. We have different types of melanomas and like to break it into um, essentially melanomas that are caused by chronic sun exposure, meaning if you're, you know, like you, you describe what we heard patients tanning for hours and hours for days because that was a culture back then. And then we, we have melanomas that are a function of that exposure. But then there's also melanomas that may not just be from chronic years of sun exposure, but can occur in the eyes, on the nails, on the hands. It essentially is from any nevi or nevus is a mole, as, we, as most patients call it, but it really is makes, made up of melanocytes. It's a nevus of melanocyte cells. And those can go haywire anywhere. And when they do go haywire on the nails, the hands, the soles of the feet, or the eyes, or the mouth, it is a significantly more risky uh, a disease with a much higher rate of, of metastases and death. And those tend to be in patients with darker skin color, black patients, uh, yeah, Indian patients, Asian patients. Um, and so we have to remind them to be more vigilant, not necessarily for maybe screening the way we think of patients who have chronic exposure, but probably the group that I care to more to reach out to, to educate that if you see any type of nail streak, any new mole that you don't identify, you haven't seen, the alarm should be going off because that's much more worried. I worry about that patient more than somebody who's done 25 years of sun tanning uh, and, and uh, you know, has already even had a history of non-melanoma skin cancer mm -hmm. because it, because we know those patients are going to get small little lesions. It's that small little one in a darker patient that mm -hmm. I'm worried about because it can cause death if you delay it six months or 12 months. Yeah, actually I had a patient who uh, has a family history of melanoma. And I just said, look, I want you to see the eye doctor. And sure enough, she had melanoma of the eye. And that was like almost 20 years ago now. She's, she, unfortunately she had to have the eye removed, but she's doing, she's doing great. Um, but I think, you know, for those of us who have more melanin in our skin, we always think that this is, sort of fair skin, people with red hair, you know, Irish people, that that's, that's theirs. But I don't think that there is enough of a recognition that everybody is really prone to this. And so when somebody has it in their nail, what should they look for? What does that look like? We, we worry about streaks of pigment in the nail. So if you see a dark line, what we call longitudinal melanonychia, a dark line, it's essentially a mole of the nail fold. As the nail grows out, that dark mole is growing out with it to make a, a line. And anytime you see that, you should have somebody to evaluate to make sure it looks regular. Uh, we don't always say that for any mole on anybody, but if there's a spot on your nail or on the palm or sole, you should have a dermatologist look at that. Um, and, and so those streaks can then change and shape and, and, and start extending onto the nail fold or the other parts of the nail that doesn't have the nail, then we really begin to worry. And we can do a small biopsy and easily diagnose that it's an outpatient procedure. Um, and, uh, and we do that, uh, I do that every week and it's comfortable and you're out in 30 minutes. And so don't put it off if you have something like that. Mm -hmm. I wanna just highlight something Dr. Patel said that it's comfortable and easy. So I, we think about you know skin cancer in older individuals. Uh, I, I recall distinctly not that long ago, I sent you a 16-year-old who had developed a band in the nail 
Um, and, and, and I think one, one of the benefits of being at GW is I can just take a quick picture, send it to Dr. Patel and in minutes he says, yeah, get that patient in and, and they're in the next week. Um, and the patient underwent a nail box. And this was, this was a, young, a young guy, you know, like a teenager. And, and that was exactly the feedback I got. Like, oh, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Um, mm-hmm. Certainly be a lot worse if it was something concerning and then caught too late. So I think it's important that this can occur in all ages, not just in all skin tones. Um, and that a simple procedure can really define what the next steps are. So certainly waiting is not the best approach. Mm-hmm. I know we're talking about the sun, but Dr. Friedman, I know that you have a new initiative with one of our um, partners, Temple of Praise, which is an award eight. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? What is What are you working with the temple on? Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the things I think this past year has highlighted um, is there, there are more disparities than we ever even appreciated. And, and we know there have been healthcare disparities in terms of access to uh, practitioners, to medications, and certainly some of the, the uh, there are certain areas, especially in DC, uh, that are experiencing this more than others. Throw in then a pandemic where even if you could get to a physician, you can't actually go to physician because we've now moved, you know, at least at the early stages to predominantly telemedicine using computers, video cameras, things like that to interface with healthcare. If you have a digital divide or digital disparity, that only adds on to the health inequity. Um, and, and so one of the conditions I really love to take care of because it's so disabling is something called atopic dermatitis. Uh, this is the most common form of eczema, which the best way to think about it is a red flaky rash that affects all ages, not just children, um, that has a unique itch that feels amazing to scratch. So you keep scratching and scratching and making the condition worse. Um, and actually, thanks to an, another colleague of ours here at GW, one of our other dermatologists, Dr. John Silverberg, uh, has done a ton of research showing that this is one of the most disabling chronic conditions, more so than common uh, medical problems that Dr. Gigi, you see every day, like high blood pressure and diabetes. And so knowing- Can, you, so, can we stop and you can yeah. say that again? Because <laughs> when you first shared that statistic, yeah. I really have to say, I didn't believe, I, I mean, it's not when I reflect on it, of course, but- it's disabling because you're, it, you know, you're scratching, you can't sleep. Uh, exactly. There is, of course, the cosmetic aspect. Children can't focus on school. So, of course, when you think about it, it makes more sense. But to think that it's more disabling than diabetes really caught my attention. Yeah, you know, I, I think very often with skin disease, uh, it, it can be dismissed. Like, oh, it's just a rash or it's just a pimple. And, and the impact on quality of life uh, can be overlooked to those who don't necessarily suffer with these conditions. Uh, and these are really common conditions. You know, eczemas overall affect roughly 30 million Americans. Moderate to severe uncontrolled atopic dermatitis, we're talking about millions of people. And we know that certain demographics, uh, especially from certain studies, uh, individuals who self-report as black or Hispanic actually have more severe disease for a couple different reasons. Um, this is a condition that affects every facet of life and it affects the community. You know, we are not our own island. So think about if you yourself were not sleeping, we're scratching constantly, couldn't pay attention, we're irritable. How does it affect your family members? How does it affect your classmates? How does it affect your coworkers? Um, So this really is a condition that percolates throughout um, one's entire community. And so realizing how our inability to get at patients who may be at higher risk and suffering more was made even worse by the pandemic, um, we we look to um, creating a a system that you you actually were were integral to to, um, developing uh, with Dr. Neil Sicca, the kind of telehealth help desk where we create a kind of almost like a genius bar, like Apple has, um, at a community center where those who live in that community who don't have access to healthcare can come in, easy access. We teach those individuals, in this case, those with atopic dermatitis, how to use telemedicine and and technologies or even give them those technologies to access a physician um, so that they can continue onward to be able to get the great care here at, at GW. And so we're very fortunate to receive a grant um, from Pfizer, which, which honestly, without uh, the help of the Rodham Institute and those networks you've created for over so many years, there's no way we would have been able to get that funding. Um, we now are in the process of developing this help desk uh, at Temple of Praise in Ward 8 for those uh, who suffer from atopic dermatitis to get them the care they need and deserve to be able to really 
uh, gain control of, of, of their daily lives. Um, and this, I hope, is a model for well beyond just atopic dermatitis. You know, in, in Dr. Patel's world, um, certainly there are, are well-known disparities in identifying skin cancer and getting care uh, for patients with, with skin cancer in darker skin types. Um, there's a dermatologist by the name of uh, Dr. Ade Adamson in, in Texas, who has really done tremendous work showing that individuals with darker skin who have skin cancer are diagnosed later their care is delayed, and sometimes they don't even get that care because they're distrustful of the healthcare system and for mm -hmm. good reason. Mm -hmm. So my hope is that this will be a stepping stone to expand well beyond eczema, but mm -hmm. also allow patients uh, with other skin issues to once again, get great care that we can offer here at GW. Well, you know, you said so much there. I want to just follow up because I've seen it happen where a patient gets referred and they have this skin condition and they keep getting told it's fungus, it's fungus, it's fungus, and it ends up being sarcoidosis because nobody actually biopsied it, right? So they're getting treatment and it maybe gets a little bit better, maybe not. Uh, so there is a bias, uh, you know, when people come in who are of darker skin tones that some physicians or some clinicians say, oh, I don't know. I don't know how to deal with that or just, you know, use steroids or an antifungal and that's sort of where it stops. Uh, but the other thing that you mentioned, and I'd like to know why, why is uh, sort of the, why are rather the outcomes worse? Is it, is it only because of the access to care or is there something in addition, uh, you know, to that? Yeah, it, it's E all the above. So I think that we, we are only starting to learn about even common conditions like atopic dermatitis in different demographics. And I think this is a failure, uh, sadly, of you know, uh, the clinical trial programs that when you look at the demographics of those who participate, you're talking 80, 85% are gonna be uh, fair skin, white, and then a very small amount are gonna be uh, other demographics. They don't take into account that maybe these conditions have a greater impact or affect more individuals in those demographics. And what we're learning, at least for atopic dermatitis, is that in different, um, in, in different demographics, uh, in different backgrounds, genetic backgrounds, the disease behaves very differently, even at the cellular level. There are some studies emerging showing that eczema, even at the cellular level, is different in, for example, Asian skin versus someone uh, uh, non-Hispanic white. So th the reality is, one, we need to better understand how these conditions behave in different demographics. But two, we then need to understand how drugs behave in different demographics, because we can't generalize the data from a clinical trial program to everybody if it hasn't been studied in everybody. And, and so really I, I use this as a call to action that we need to uh, push industry to make sure that they are inclusive in their clinical trial programs so that we understand the condition, but also how uh, these diseases uh, work. But I, I think beyond that, to your point, access to care, um, eczema literally means to fail <laughs> up. And it is a condition that if you do not treat it, it will get worse and worse and it will flare. And actually there's some data showing that often those with eczema during a flare are actually thinking ahead to their neck when the next flare is gonna happen. That's how disabling this condition can be. Mm -hmm. And so it does snowball out of control. And so you're right, if you don't have access to care and you can't stop this, you can't quiet this or turn off the fire, um, it will just continue to get worse and it will progress. And someone who has mild disease may progress over time to more moderate to severe if they're not captured early. So I think mm -hmm. access to care plays a big role, but I think there are nuances we don't understand just yet. They're at the biological level as well. Sure. So Dr. Patel, let's talk about vitamin D. <laughs> vitamin D has gotten more attention, especially during COVID because of some associations. And you know, when I screen patients for vitamin D uh, deficiency, the lowest numbers I see are among uh, people who are darker skin tones. So what's the deal with vitamin D and cancer risk, skin cancer risk? Is there an association? Uh, what, what do you say to that, Dr. Patel? So we, we usually talk about vitamin D when we're thinking about, well, patients ask us about, well, how do I be sun safe and sun smart um, and not get my vitamin D because I'm getting it from the sun? And, and if that first part of that education um, goes into understanding that, that you get enough of your sun 
to produce the vitamin D um, or really make that conversion into active vitamin D, which is part of the critical steps uh, uh, in that production. Um, from your prop day-to-day activity, you know, from going outside to, to grab your lunch, walking around a day like today, I decided to, to walk home, um, it, it is more than an, an adequate amount. Uh, and, and so patients should not be worried about that as a source, uh, or as a limiting source for their vitamin D. Um, there's a host of not just vitamin D, but other types of dietary supplements and, Skin cancer is no different than other types of cancer that we know that having um, antioxidants or, or foods and, and medications that have antioxidants in them are helpful to prevent cancer risk, um, as well as certain uh, vitamins, uh, niacinamide is another one, uh, vitamin D, even uh, you know in red wine, we know there's antioxidants. These have been all shown in the laboratory to reduce skin cancer but it's not gonna be a silver bullet that all of a sudden we can increase our uptake. It is, as you said, screening for patients for deficiencies and having a balanced and moderate approach that we get those numbers up and figuring out what that is. And that usually is a diet related issue and trying to balance out your diet than then saying, well, I'm not getting enough sun, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I wanna make sure that the audience knows because when you say there is something good in red wine, people are like, oh, okay, if right. half a glass is good, a glass is better. But the yeah. thing is, is that you have to balance risk for all things, right? So for example, uh, for women, drinking more than seven glasses of any alcoholic drink, be it beer, wine, or hard liquor in a week actually significantly increases breast cancer and other cancer risks. Yeah. So people will say, well, you know, in, in France, the risk of heart disease is a lot lower, people are drinking alcohol. Well, I said, yes, but cancer risk is higher, right? So we have to kind of take all of that into consideration. And, and we should also say that it, when you look at, and you look at those groups that did the best, it again comes down to moderation. It's mm -hmm. a small amount over a, a period of time, a larger period of time. And so what you're really doing is trying to get the maximal benefit of those, those you know, natural occurring substances, mm -hmm. minerals, whatever it may mm -hmm. be um, mm -hmm. in, in a moderated amount slowly throughout time rather than, uh, as you said, uh, a large amount over the week, which then even for skin cancer increases yeah. your risk of melanoma. So it's yeah. not, it is not a silver bullet, just like vitamin D. So tell us about makeup with SPF. Does that make sense? Or is it a hoax or what? Makeup with SPF makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, it, it is any way, as, as Dr. Friedman said earlier, any way you can get your SPF, get your SPF. Um, but makeup is really great. And now there's a lot of different uh, versions and, and what works for you. It really, you need to be conscious about looking at the back of the label and understanding what it is using those, those few primers of, is it one spectrum, broad spectrum, what that number of coverage is. Um, and, uh, but if, if you can utilize that, uh, that is a great way. My experiences, um, from, from understanding from the dermatologists who recommend certain brands, because it's not, that's not in my forte of doing makeup or recommending a certain type of okay. makeup. I say, get it where you can get it. It tends to not be high enough. And so you need to combine that, um, with something else, mm -hmm. it, especially if you're doing an activity, but if you have a short commute and you're just getting to work and you're walking, then that usually is a sufficient amount for that exposure period. Mm -hmm. Um, but don't forget reapply. You mean your, your makeup is not as good as when you put it in the morning later in terms of the SPF aspect of it. So it's not going to be there right. when the sun at four o'clock of your commute is and is, is quite high at that point. Yeah. Um, and, and well, you know, one of the points that Dr. Friedman made, which I don't think a lot of people think about is the, are the lips as being, you know, protected. Uh, people tend to think of the skin and, you know, maybe missing the, around the eyes, but the lips are certainly, uh, I think a blind spot for a lot of people. Uh, so I was going to ask you a question that just flew out of my mind. So anything else that, you know, uh, any uh, other uh, myths that you have, you know, you want to dispel kind of now is your, your chance. Well, I, I you know, I think, Dr. Freeman touched upon the disparities issue. It's something we've taken um, very seriously at GW on all aspects of our, our, our program, our clinical program, our administrative and residency side. Um, and, and I really like to, to, to inform and, and educate patients about 
how important, not just that disparities from outcomes, which are striking, um, but also just the, the incidence rates of how cancer occurs. Uh, black patients, Indian patients, Asian patients, we can get melanoma, we can get skin cancers. And, and, and your risk of, uh, of a skin cancer needs to really be assessed by a professional and then determining what kind of management approach you need needs to be decided between you and your physician. So I tell this to patients with lighter skin or darker skin, it's not a checkbox that you say, well, I, I had my annual exam and, and I'm done. Well, uh -huh. do you even need an annual exam? Do you need it to be less frequent or more frequent? Or do you need to look for certain things because you have a risk due uh -huh. to your genetic makeup, your family makeup, your ex sun exposure? Uh -huh. um, my, our street outside is, is uh, this, this is a joke. My, my son, as Dr. Freeman said, our, our kids, they grew not with a silver spoon in their mouths, but with a bottle of sunscreen in their hands. And my son at 18 months, I remember him grabbing for the sunscreen and putting it on his face. And I have a 15 month old and is now copying that. Oh, wow. But outside we have some construction crews working out there. Mm -hmm. And I remember, and my son remember, went out there and I said, did you apply your sunscreen to the, to the gentleman? And oh. I, that's when you need to think about that, depending on your profession and your exposure, um, you need to make that, understand that whole global picture. A little mini health ambassador there, and caring <laughs> for his community. I love it. Oh, this is, I remember the question. So uh, skin cancers don't only happen where there is sun exposure because the skin is an organ. Can you talk to about us about that, Dr. Friedman? Yeah, sure. So actually the, the very first case of melanoma that I ever saw was actually on my OBGYN rotation as a third year med student. Um, and, and this is not to instill fear, but uh, you know, there you can even get uh, melanomas where the sun doesn't shine and it can be very mm -hmm. difficult to detect because you wouldn't expect that. Um, and, and so when we talk about skin cancer surveillance or a full body skin exam, it literally means a full body skin exam. You are getting butt naked uh, and we are looking everywhere. And, and I would encourage uh, if you go to get this done, um, and, and someone doesn't look everywhere, make sure they do. And we talk about, you know, literally, you know, in the groin, buttocks, between the toes, feet, hands, mm -hmm. throughout mm -hmm. the scalp. I mean, this should take a good amount of time and you mm -hmm. should be moving around. And I, I tell, I joke with patients that it's, it's almost like your morning uh, exercise. So I have to get up, get down, bend over, you know? So I, I feel like um, it really needs to cover the gamut because you're right. Even though the sun is the most common external force driving skin cancer, Genetics plays a big role and you can get it in other locations where the sun will never hit. Uh, it more has to do with your immune makeup, but also your genetic makeup and family history plays a very big role in that as well. Mm -hmm. But correct me if I'm wrong, is it like if the sun were to, to shine on my face, the rest of my skin is also responding to that sunshine? So you're, you're, you're absolutely correct in that. Thank you, Dr. Patel, yeah. for saving me. <laughs> no, <laughs> you are. Dr. Freeman was looking at me like I was. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. You Patel. You were right on the money. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and, and so for something, you know, we, 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 the skin is quite complex in that there's an interplay uh, of if you get you, you can you, know, you can do the, the experiment where you uh, you you wear your short sleeve shirt and you realize your stomach got tan just like your arms got tan. It's because your body responds to that UV radiation. It tells the rest of the cells that make up the melanin it's time to move those pigment uh, molecules up higher to protect you because we're seeing sun elsewhere. We want to protect the rest of our body elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but but I'm gonna touch upon not just that you know skin cancer where the sun doesn't shine from a UV, that's an external uh, stimuli, but there are other types of external stimuli. For example, viruses can cause skin cancer. Skin cancer mm -hmm. just means a, car a carcinoma of those cells that make up the skin. What can lead to that can be, can be a multitude of things. And in here in, in DC, we have a specialized clinic at GW for patients who are at high risk for skin cancer. One of those risk groups, we talked about organ transplant patients, but it's also patients with HIV mm -hmm. and patients with HIV sometimes have uh, HPV infections. And those combinations can increase your risk of skin cancer in areas where the sun doesn't shine. Mm -hmm. And so if you think, what I tell my patients, it's, it's less important to me that you just come and check the box that you came to see me. That's like a snapshot Polaroid picture. 
we want to have a, a nine millimeter film view of your skin. So if mm -hmm. you notice something is new, different, or you don't remember it, come in to see me, don't wait. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And soon we'll get to the digital picture when we're using and we're starting to get there using artificial intelligence genomics to personalize mm -hmm. your risk, truly personalize you, figure out what are the genes that are driving that specific mm -hmm. lesion? Mm -hmm. And is that one that we should worry about in you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was a question before we finish up because I think we just have a couple of minutes. This the time has flown by, but there was a question in the chat about gel manicures, which I guess can sometimes cause lines in the in the fingernails. Can you speak about those? Well, yeah, I think, you know, so one thing to consider is that with certain gel manicures, you're using UV radiation to harden them. And there actually is a nice amount of evidence showing that that UV exposure can cause skin cancer uh, under the nail, around the nail fold. Oh, and those can be very difficult to treat. So, um, you know, myself, Dr. Patel, but even at the national level in the American Academy of Dermatology, there's a real push away from using UV hardening um, mm -hmm. for, for, for gel manicures. The other thing that can happen, you know, we mentioned that those lines, those black lines can indicate that there's a mole growing where the nail is made um, and that mole may get kind of funky. We have to check it out. Um, but trauma can also cause those lines. Nail fungus can cause those lines. We actually sometimes see those lines in construction workers from the vibration yes. of their tools. We can see those. So I think something to consider is, is there just one? You have one finger involved versus multiple. And sometimes it can just be a normal variant. Some people just make these dark lines that are multiple of them. Uh, not to say, uh, go to Dr. Google and figure it out yourselves. Please come to us and make sure that it is okay. But it's really that single line um, you know, the, the kind of asymmetry being on maybe one finger um, that really we, we need to think uh, a little deeper on if it is something concerning. And of course, uh, to take the necessary steps to confirm if it is or is not something that we need to be taken care of. Well, and, and to Dr. Patel's point, if it's something new or different, right, uh, that's, that's also a guide. Well, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Um, Patel uh, and Dr. Friedman. This has been so illuminating and we appreciate your time. We appreciate your education of us on this very important topic. So whether whatever your skin tone is, you got to respect the sun and <laughs> use the sun, SPF. And uh, for more information, uh, if there's any question at all about there being a skin cancer, run, don't walk to your nearest uh, physician, uh, preferably the dermatologist. So. Dr. Friedman, Dr. Patel, thank you so much on behalf of the Rodham Institute. Really appreciate your time this evening. Thanks so thank much. You. Thank you.